uh, just to, because I didn't get to contribute into the, the poll uh, at the beginning, I, I should clarify that, yes, I'm from Queensland. I've worked uh, in uh, Townsville at James Cook University uh, prior to being at the University of the Sunshine Coast. So I've been uh, in Queensland for must be more than 15 years, but prior to that, I did all of my study um, at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, which is where I grew up and sort of developed a, a love of seaweed there. So today's talk is going to be talking about seaweed, of course, um, but probably taking you from the normal place that you're happy with on the reef in the beautiful pristine environments, stepping across to the seaweed, the one that I'm particularly interested in, which which is called asparagopsis, a red seaweed, and then making this link right down to cows at the end as well. So if you'll bear with me, and now that Cheyenne's uh, launched a, a couple of polls, I thought it was a good way to kick off um, the event by actually starting with a poll, because it, before we get to talk too much about these wonderful new applications for seaweed and things like agriculture, it's quite important to um, actually get in there and um, start um, by doing the Doing this. So here we go. We'll, we'll start there, launching the, the first poll. So, what comes to mind when you hear the word seaweed? This is something that we asked about 500 odd Australians in an official study uh, about three years ago that we've just been publishing all the findings from. You can answer multiple times. And uh, it's quite an emotive thing, and it's an interesting part as being a scientist these days is to actually start to, to look at uh, the sort of feelings or the just behind the data as well. So, look, the, the reality is that we've been working on seaweed for a long time. Um, in Australia, we don't have a huge amount of exposure to consuming it, but in Asia, that's certainly not the case. So, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up that poll and, and share the results with everybody. So, you can see there that what comes to mind. I don't know if this was the uh, uh, A, B, C, uh, D things. Most people think about algae, of course. That tends to indicate there are a bunch of scientists uh, probably on the, the Zoom chat tonight, so that's great. People are talking about the ocean as well and sushi and, and all of the above. So you'll be pleased to know that most people, uh, when they were talking about uh, seaweed, answered around um, the ocean as well. They instantly, um, this is consumers, 500 consumers in Australia talked about sushi, the beach, sea and kelp. It's all pretty standard things, right? So when we followed up with the next question, which was uh, eating seaweed is, uh, it's the second little poll here. I thought I'd, uh, I'd share the next one as well. So we've got an extra little poll. We can compare our scientists again uh, to the consumers. So probably uh, cheating a little bit, staring at the, the background here, which is uh, for not having an animation. But and when can we, I just uh, jump in quickly? Did I, can everybody see that poll? I'm just checking because I can't see it pop up on mine. I think that's just because you're a, a host as well, Jody. So uh, it's definitely, yes. definitely working on that side. So we're always interested in the, the, the food side of things because that's the, the standard place to start with. And so just uh, wrapping that one up pretty quickly as well. Let's see how we go. We've got a, yep, it's very healthy, uh, which is something that uh, certainly happened on, the, on the, the consumer study as well. People said that it was good, that was funny. Um, but then obviously delicious and, and different, interesting, that's great. No one said disgusting. Um, but or gross, but they were quite clearly popping up when we were asking 500 uh, random consumers across the country. So this is what we're always sort of dealing with when working with seaweed, is the knowledge uh, side of things, um, but also uh, when it comes to the, the actual consumption and the like and the education, people are, are then very emotive. Either they like something or they don't like something. So the next one was one final poll, just to, to keep this poll uh, poll best running along. So feeding seaweed to cows is weird, wonderful, uh, nori, and there's potassium in uh, certain red seaweeds that's much higher than in bananas. So these are things that we normally consider seaweed as a superfood, especially in somewhere like Australia or in Western cultures where we don't have a strong tradition of eating seaweeds. And so that pops up in the media quite a bit, um, no matter whether you say it or not, people are often talking about superfood, especially. Look out 
into the coastline, there's lots of different types of seaweeds that are quite spectacular in, in shape and structure and, and certainly in flavour and taste. These are sea grapes that we have off the coast here in the Sunshine Coast, but also across the whole Indo-Pacific where they're eaten in a number of uh, different uh, cultures. Um, I work and I'm very privileged to work across uh, a number of different countries, so Fiji and Samoa and Kiribati in the Pacific Islands, but also in Indonesia, which is uh, one of the, the basically the largest seaweed producer in the world. We gain a lot of inspiration uh, from these places in terms of the types of seaweeds that they use and, and how they actually prepare them. So edible seaweeds in the Pacific Islands can be found in the marketplace. So in the normal fresh food marketplace, you can see uh, sea grapes here being picked up um, just in um, banana leaves where they're sold with chili and a little bit of fermented coconut. I'm not a big fan of the uh, fermented coconut. It's quite, quite strong. There's other green seaweeds and red seaweeds where they're using uh, to make cakes and the like as well. And people tend to like uh, the seaweed quite a lot. In Indonesia, because the seaweed industry itself is far more advanced, there's lots of different types of products and you're seeing lots of processed products that are for sale uh, in, in different shops and even exclusive shops where they only sell seaweed products. So things like ice cream, so carrageenan has traditionally been one of the main um, components, uh, a thickener in ice cream products in Western cultures as well. Uh, my favourite, which was seaweed brownings, I mean a small amount of seaweed, but still pretty tasty going in there. And uh, seaweed coated banana fritters as well as chips and crackers and, and the like. So lots of different um, angles for different types of seaweed products that we're always getting inspiration uh, for here because we don't have a seaweed industry in, in Australia yet and so one of the, the big things in terms of the overall um, seaweed uh, production ideas for Australia is that we have to actually create a market there's no point just doing the science to work out what species of seaweed can we grow um, how fast can it grow where can it grow whether it's in the sea or on land if we don't actually have the market pulling that along so we've done a lot of work on that uh, consumer side, which is where I started the whole talk. And it's really to make sure that what we do start to produce, there's enough of a market uh, demand there. So this um, is a wonderful bowl that our nutrition students, which is one of the, the key programs that USC on the Sunshine Coast were making with snapper and green uh, seaweed sealers and uh, red seaweed called sarcanema that's got carrageenan inside it um, and mushrooms there with this wonderful broth. And they, they basically were um, reducing the amount of uh, stock that was being used by putting seaweed in with that wonderful umami taste. So lots of different angles there. Um, but the reality is that even if we look at all these different um, species that we have in Australia and there are thousands of species again in Australia, it's one of the most biodiverse regions in the world uh, for seaweed. Um, and we have these, these great seaweeds that we're culturing at a pretty large scale at the university um, at Bribey Island Research Centre, which I'll come to later in the talk. You have to sort of go, well, all right, there's all these superfoods that are turning up, things like kale and, and bugs and the like, and I'm constantly asking, what niche superfood would you prefer? Seaweed or crickets? I think I'd choose seaweed. And, but the reality is we can only grow so much of it. This is only going to be a, a reasonably uh, small scale endeavour for quite some time in Australia because while the demand is there and there's a lot of um, expertise in terms of uh, uh, chefs and high profile chefs, uh, master chef type chefs, for example, constantly using uh, seaweed. Back in the, the day, I was actually providing um, some of the seaweed that we were producing at a university to Peter Gilmore when he was at Key Restaurant before Master Chef fame and the like. And so these types of food products start um, in these high end or sort of niche places and they might sort of get to supermarkets if we're lucky, but it's not going to be enough to sustain a whole new growing industry. So that's the real segue here is what can seaweed do in other aspects of our life um, in both an environmental benefit side of things but also potentially in agriculture. So some of you might have actually seen that one of our the most high profile seaweed uh, sort of seaweed fans, I guess I'd, I'd call him, uh, is Professor Tim Flannery. And he's even written a book called Sunlight and Seaweed, which is his argument for how to feed, power and clean up the world using both solar energy and seaweed. On the seaweed side of things, it's all about this mid-ocean. So in the middle of the ocean, kelp farming, so big chunky seaweeds that you can actually um, produce and grow for uh, many months that strip down the carbon dioxide from 
that basically from the air that's going mixing into the surface layers. And they do that because they're so good at uh, photosynthesizing, they're actually pulling out all that CO2 and using it in photosynthesis, storing that carbon in those uh, structural polysaccharides that I was talking about at the beginning. And at the same time, that's actually pushing the pH to, uh, towards the basic side of things, so it's deacidifying the water. So if we're going to start in the numbers that he proposes in the book to talk about 53 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, that would need. 9% of the world's ocean surface to do that, the amount of seaweed. 9%. It's huge. It's a really big uh, scale. It's technically possible. It's just not economically feasible at the moment because we're talking about something that's 4.5 times the size of Australia, but we should keep working on it. Likewise, we have another environmental angle where people are very keenly pursuing the idea of seaweed. And this is the one called integrated aquaculture, where the concept of multiple species of uh, aquaculture products growing together in an environmentally friendly way. So the, the core premise being that you have something like a fish pen where feed is going in. That feed will obviously go to the fish, helps them grow fast, um, but the, it's unavoidable that there's always some waste and there's two different types of waste. There's dissolved uh, nutrients that are waste and there's also particulate nutrients. So seaweed is on the, often talked about as being one of the main uh, sources of being able to extract all that dissolved nitrogen so ammonium and nitrate that's coming from the waste products of the fish and the um, breakdown of the, any uneaten feed. Likewise, you can have a whole lot of filter feeders, so shellfish, oysters, mussels adjacent to it, um, which can actually take that particulate um, waste and, and break it down and use it for growth. And then likewise, also deposit feeders in the bottom. So lots of different combinations of different species. So sea urchins, sea cucumbers, all working together in this wonderful sort of ecosystem as much as you can start to replicate it with the least number of organisms. So this is particularly important for Australia because most of you might know this, and if you don't, it's always very surprising, is that we're a net importer of seafood. So we actually import 70% of our seafood quantity and, and value essentially um, and because it's being produced overseas and what we're exporting is our high value products to niche markets, um, in, especially in Asia. So that's something that from a food security point of view, we have to be better about it. And certainly our large aquaculture companies, those especially around salmon uh, in uh, Tasmania and prawn production, are looking at ways of having this integrated culture as a way of diversifying um, the product stream but also the environmental side. So two big angles for why seaweed can be good for both stripping out carbon dioxide um, and then also cleaning up the water. So these are important angles because we need to come back to them to work out how, how can we actually start to produce an industry uh, for seaweed for all of these products. So my next poll. This is uh, the last poll, so don't get too concerned that we're constantly going to be going to polls. So we had some uh, recent coverage, which was uh, great. And basically, um, Japanese game show covered uh, a lot of the work that we're doing. So watch this clip very carefully, and then you'll be able to answer the poll question. <laughs> まあ、4つを some people didn't need their uh, Japanese uh, background there to answer that question. It's pretty, pretty clear uh, from that result. Maybe, maybe not if you speak Japanese, but it was a uh, great coverage. It was this uh, fancy game show in Japan that aired on their public broadcaster uh, about uh, six weeks ago. So it's hot off the press. Uh, and you'll be pleased to know for those people that have answered, I'll just open it for another few seconds. Looks like we've got quite a good, good coverage there. There we go. You're smack on. The most uh, important part of a cow when it comes to methane emissions is actually burping. And it's 90% It's 90 basically coming from the front end and 10% uh, from the rear. So congratulations, round of applause, uh, everybody. That was pretty, pretty impressive. Um, no one ticked 100% to the rear. Obviously, some people thought that quite a lot was going out the back end, and certainly anyone who's worked in uh, around cattle, dairy, and beef would beg to differ. Uh, I was talking to uh, a 
former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd at one point, and he's an ex-dairy farmer, and we were talking about this application, and he certainly begged to differ about the fact that it was mostly coming from the front end. So, but it is important. And so what that video was showing um, was that the seaweed, when it's going into the cow, into the rumen, so they're their stomach, there's a whole lot of microbes there that are normally being involved in breaking down um, all of the uh, carbohydrates, the fiber and the like, and giving the energy to the cattle. Um, and then they're constantly belching. So they're not stopping belching when they're eating the seaweed, they're actually just no longer belching methane. So it's a nice sort of nice way to uh, continue on there. So this is the the strange situation of rumen, which is an incredible microbial um, fest of um, lots of different microorganisms involved in breaking down and providing uh, energy for the cows. So the reason why we're so interested though in methane um, as a, a, a greenhouse gas is that it has a global warming potential roughly 28 times that of carbon dioxide. So for every molecule of methane, it's much worse than every molecule of carbon dioxide. So this is a, a really big thing uh, from a global point of view. And you may have heard uh, Bill Gates saying that uh, cattle are the fifth largest country in the world uh, in terms of the amount of emissions that they have. So that's about 6% of um, global greenhouse gas, gas emissions that are from methane. And in Australia, we're particularly exposed um, because we have a very large cattle herd, so 27 million head of cows, mostly beef, um, and 15% of our total emissions are from agriculture, and two thirds of that, so basically 10% are from all of the, the ruminants. So it's a pretty um, big thing when it comes to that. So what about the cows? What do they think about this? Really? Well, the, the nice thing is that the history of, of why we ended up working on um, looking at seaweed is that for those uh, cattle farms that are and, and farmers who are adjacent to coastal areas across norm, uh, the Northern Hemisphere mostly, um, they would notice that at times cattle would go down to the shore and actually start nibbling away on the kelp. And one um, scientist in Canada, Dr. Rob Kinley, who's now with the CSIRO in Australia, was working with um, one of the cattle farmers and eating this brown seaweed, the kelp, and uh, there was lots of anecdotes. The fact that the cows were healthier and happier, uh, and they were actually, uh, he went in there and measured the amount of methane out of curiosity and found that there was a drop, a small drop in the amount of methane when they were eating the kelp. And at the same time, we started working on uh, testing a whole range of different types of seaweeds uh, in, in Australia. And um, the results got out. This was some of the most uh, sort of high profile media work that I've certainly been involved in. Remembering it's a big team of uh, researchers from universities and uh, government science agencies uh, and students were involved as well. And so getting this great coverage where people are really, really interested in the fact that a small sprinkle of this seaweed can uh, knock out methane um, production from the cows without having any negative effects. So the reason why people are looking at this, and certainly in Australia, we have um, lots of beef cattle um, in places like New Zealand, there's lots of dairy cattle in California, lots of beef and dairy. So lots of different countries and, and states are sort of looking at it. And we have to actually be able to use a feed additive which is only going in at a tiny fraction. So the feed formulation of cows, especially when they're in feedlots, when they're coming in and being fed, are so specialised that you can't actually displace much of that. So you can't compromise any of the existing feed formulations, remembering that there's the actual feedlot um, farm, basically, where the animals are, and then they're normally buying the feed from another big company as well. So to actually be able to get into the supply chain, it needs to be something that's a very a high powered one. Um, we, know, we know that it needs to be natural for a number of reasons. Um, certainly consumer expectations of the case. And when we look at supermarkets in Australia, um, we're basically seeing that uh, people are wanting things to be hormone free, chemical free. Um, but there's also industry regulations on both the veterinary side, the regulators in Australia won't just let any um, chemical or any um, additive go into feed. It needs to be rigorously sort of uh, tested. And likewise, um, you can't synthesize uh, chemicals from scratch and put it into feed, especially if those chemicals are themselves greenhouse gases. So there's a few different angles there, but overall we're typically moving to a, a state of more climate friendly farming and our red meat industry in Australia has sort of vowed to be carbon neutral farming by 2030. 
So that's not too far away now. Um, but then there's lots of different angles in the feed additive through seaweed is only one of those. So we did some science, of course, uh, lots of science, lots of publications, lots of uh, peer review and uh, lots of interest then that came from it. This was the, the original piece of work um, done by Lorena Machado, who was a PhD student at James Cook University at the time, um, and testing lots of different seaweeds that we had off the coast of Townsville. So this is the Great Barrier Reef, uh, there's different green algae, brown algae and red algae. Um, so what we're looking at here is the amount of methane that's being uh, produced um, in terms of volume per grams of organic matter of the, the seaweed uh, and the varieties that were going in over time and so looking at how that tracks and you can see that for most of them the methane is just increasing over time and so basically this was in a um, in a different uh, controlled setting with a, in a, in a vial they're using some of the room and fluid um, and putting in the seaweed and testing it and so the one thing one magic seaweed you can't even see it at the bottom because it's so flat is that it had zero effect to the point where we thought something must have been wrong with that treatment, went back in and tested it again, and then tested it a number of times since in lots of different uh, situations and concentrations. And it's consistently the only seaweed that significantly reduces the amount of methane, not just a little bit, can completely knock it out at the right concentration. So that was considered remarkable in the sense that it was a very clear and inventive step as the patent attorneys would say. And so that opens up a whole other opportunity is that while we're looking at it from uh, sort of a scientific curiosity point of view, looking at it from an industry application point of view, but one of the real ways to ensure that there is some value around that is to be able to protect it in a way that companies could actually use it and, and people can actually start to um, base um, have some confidence around developing into a product. So two patents actually emerged from that, which the CSIRO currently hold. Um, the inventors are across all, um, all three uh, original groups. Uh, and so this was the method for reducing the uh, total gas production of methane in a ruminant, so not just cows. So ruminants include sheep and goats deer um, and various other things of course uh, cattle are the most important ones there from a, a production point of view in terms of um, being able to put them into feedlots but goat is actually the most widely consumed meat in the world if you didn't know that although it tends to be more of a, a sort of small um, holder sort of farmer livelihood type of thing so it's harder to introduce this type of innovation the second thing which was probably the most important part in the end and it's something just to add from a scientific point of view that it you can't just have um, a negative in the sense that you can pay for the amount of uh, climate change busting uh, that the methane uh, removal can do. We actually found that when you do that, the animals grow faster. And so when they are fed the seaweed, that conversion of the energy that would otherwise be wasted by methane belching uh, is actually then put into animal production. They can be about 20% faster. So a normal steer is uh, turned off in the industry sense every, every at about five years, more than uh, five, 600 uh, kilograms. And so that could actually be reduced by about 20%. So it's a significant amount of um, application there. The reason why it's sort of so uh, specific is that the seaweed has uh, a compound in it that targets the one portion of the microbiome. And these are the archaea, so these are the really old uh, microbes, so they're not considered bacteria, uh, but these are the ones that are methanogens that are making the methane in the room. Um, and they're there essentially mopping up a lot of the waste products from the breakdown from the, it's called them the good bucks, uh, that are doing the right thing for digestion of the animal. Um, and the fact is that it's this one compound bromoform. So it's tribromomethane. It's a very simple compound. It's single carbon, three bromines and one hydrogen. Um, and it interrupts part of uh, the enzymatic process in just the archaea. And so that was why it was so special where you could have the effect of getting rid of the, the archaea that are making the methane, but at the same time not impacting the uh, other bacteria there that are breaking down all the food from the animal. So no other seaweed accumulates uh, bromoform in its tissue. And we know that because they can be a bit nerdy and get in there and look under the microscope at various levels of um, high power. And so this is a light microscope. We're looking at part of the filamentous branch um, of the asparagopsis and these big brown uh, and they're actually cells, uh, the vesicles inside, are actually where all the bromoform is stored and, and a few other uh, 
halogenated metabolites too. Uh, even closer look here, some of the, the science, you can actually see this is a cross section through the, the seaweed there. And so inside that big vacuole is all these, uh, these pure uh, compounds basically the bromoform being stored there. And so there's lots of knots that you can see uh, inside the cells. This is the, the same look from a, another angle. Um, and then as we actually move up, just sort of show you as we move up through the focal plane um, of the seaweed, you can actually see that the clan cell, that dark um, brown sort of part, is actually attached essentially to the surface of the seaweed. And the reason why I wanted to share this with you is that there's a whole lot of ecological reasons for the seaweed. Um, and that's actually where I started working on this exact seaweed asparagopsis more than 20 years ago as an honor student, because I was looking at the chemical defense and how this seaweed produces these chemicals to stop microbes from settling on the surface. So bacteria, uh, sort of disease and things that happen in seaweed and also stop herbivores, so fish and abalone and other things from that. So from that, we've actually been able to sort of base the um, applied outcomes on, on the sort of more of the pure science, the ecology. And that's been my transition as a, as a scientist now. A pretty exciting thing has just happened uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, the CSIRO team have now actually launched a company uh, which is called Future Feed, and that's based on um, those two patterns and, and basically starting to scale up and looking at how to get that seaweed into Australian feedlots, get it into international feedlots as well. And so for those of you that want to have a look, you can actually sort of look in on the internet there and, and find a whole lot of more information about these different types of things. So, too good to be true. What do you think? Sounds too good to be true. I almost sound like a, a salesman sometimes when I, I start saying these things because it is such a, a clear list of everything that you want at the moment. So if, does anyone have any, any questions at this point? If, if not, I can keep going. But I would instantly be asking myself, come on, there has to be some issues. And there are. There are uh, lots of people who are looking at alternative ways of doing this, so fine-tuning different feeds, um, not to do with seaweeds at all. Uh, people are concerned um, about, oh, maybe we've got one question there. Yeah, it looks like we've got one from Sammy. Can you see that, Nick? Uh, yes. Would it be expensive uh, for the farmers to give uh, to the cattle? It's a perfect uh, segue to my next slide, Sammy. So maybe I'll just hold off on that, that question just and, and I'll, I'll come back to it in one second because um, a lot of the, the things most um, of concern at the moment are from uh, scientists and basically saying, okay, so all of these chemicals like bromoform um, are in the seaweed and they're actually going into the cows, of course, to take out the archaea. Are they accumulating in the beef? Uh, so in the meat, are they actually moving into the, the milk? So is the dairy yield or quality affected? And so at, for the last few years, remembering that we did that first uh, study back um, before 2014, that was when it was published. So people have been working on it and testing in different places. There's been dairy tests and beef um, studies done in California, uh, dairy study done in Pennsylvania. There's people in Europe who are now starting to uh, test this as well. Um, and so basically we're uh, in this point now where all of the data at the moment is saying that it is safe um, for the cows. So basically there's no negative effects on, on the cattle and on the, there's no uh, negative effects on any of the cattle products in terms of yield um, or, or taste or flavour. So that's um, pretty compelling stuff. So yeah, the, lots of questions coming in, that's good. All right, uh, does preventing methanogenesis mean, oh, sorry, click there by accident. Uh, does preventing methanogenesis mean there is an accumulation of uh, hydrogen in the rumen? And so one, yeah, that's a, it's a really uh, important point. So a lot of the times uh, hydrogen is definitely um, in, involved in, in the rumen process, but you're gonna have to, I'm sorry, Rian, you're gonna have to ask a, a microbiologist about that. So we were measuring the total gas um, uh, production uh, and because methane was such a large portion about it uh, it was it was still increasing but not the the actual hydrogen side of things so um, and hopefully we're not going to get exploding cows if that's where you're going you're right um, 
So Terry was saying it seems like it's very fast growing around here and that's true. Uh, so one of the reasons why I came to the Sunshine Coast is because Asparagopsis is, is everywhere. But the reality is on the same, on the flip side, because it is, is already um, native, first, remember it's a, um, a, a local species, so it's not as though it's an introduced one, um, and it is already quite prevalent. The idea of farming it in a different place um, is probably, in my opinion, the safest thing rather than introducing new uh, farm products. If you think about everything else that we grow at large scales in, in Australia on land, they're all introduced species, essentially. Um, and so that's something definitely to be uh, looking at as well. I'm going to have to pick off some of these other ones. So would it be expensive to the farmers to give to cattle? And this sort of comes back to the, um, so that Sammy had asked, this comes back to that same question as well, which is uh, about the growing. So the big issue, the biggest issue really is supply. Um, and so we don't have sustainable, like there's no aquaculture production of this seaweed at the moment, which is great for scientists, but really bad for farmers because it's going to be very expensive at the moment. So all the trials that we've done at reasonable scales, so um, multi-month trials feeding cows, not huge numbers because uh, they do eat quite a bit, they eat about 12 kilos of seaweed a day. Um, they uh, have been done with wild collections. And so as uh, Terry mentioned, there's lots of it off the coast here and there's lots all the way up sort of to central Queensland at certain times of the year, you can actually literally get tons of seaweed um, off, the, off the reef if you wanted to. But of course that's not um, sustainable in the long run. Um, it's not sustainable from an environmental point of view, but funnily enough, it's also not sustainable from an industry point of view because you need to have a pretty stable and consistent product um, which is hopefully very pure. Uh, and that's very difficult to do when you're actually um, just collecting from the wild because seaweeds naturally settle amongst everything else as well. I did see there as well one other thing about the, the patents. Um, I said because CSIRO has a, the patent on the process, does that mean other groups such as USC, where I am now, um, it need a sub license in order to research the process? The answer is no, um, because you, you can, you, Patents don't infringe on anything to do with research. They do infringe if I uh, find another species of Asparagopsis, for example, and then say I want to use that um, for methane reduction. Um, that claim would obviously clash directly um, with the patent. And if I then went on to commercialise that with a different partner, that would be something that would be a big um, impact. So uh, the nice thing about patents is it doesn't stop any science happening. Publications uh, can still happen. It just gives the confidence around those investors uh, for that as well. Yeah, so just saw there from John, yeah, defences against herbivores like fish. So does that affect herbivores that aren't the usual uh, predator? Um, so not, not in, in that sense, because they, if we're farming the seaweed, um, the irony is that the seaweed farms that I've been uh, working a lot with in Indonesia, remembering a really big scale, they act as fish attraction devices. So if anything, they're actually promoting a whole lot of um, environment uh, around them, uh, which is good for for uh, fish and the like, and there's no real impact on the, the sort of the water chemistry in terms of the bioactives leaching and things like that. Um, so there's yeah the last thing I'll, I'll just keep going because there's a lot of questions, which is great. We might need to go back and if I've uh, skipped a couple there because I need to sort of probably sort of round it out now to talk about the, the seaweed aquaculture and why I'm so interested in that. Um, you wouldn't know this if you were from Australia, but seaweed aquaculture is already huge. So there's more than 25 million tonnes um, produced every year, and it's more than a $7 billion industry in terms of how much um, it's being uh, produced. And so basically the, the seaweed value is essentially somewhere around $1,000 to $4,000 to $5,000 a tonne for a lot of the commodity seaweeds that's dried. That's already an order of magnitude more than, say, grain at $200. Uh, odd dollars a, a ton and sugarcane is like hundred dollars a ton. So quite a high value already. Um, so lots of different products are being produced, mostly for food. So people that have seen sort of or been to uh, Japan or China, you'll see lots and lots of uh, whole seaweed um, uh, shops where people can buy the dried seaweed. Now, the interesting thing is that it's all about aquaculture production. 
So 95% of seaweed production is actually from aquaculture. So there's only 5% of the total uh, volume that's being uh, sort of wild harvested. So that makes um, sort of aquaculture and seaweeds, sort of, well, seaweed industry, I should say, more generally, uh, is more quite sustainable compared to sort of um, fish and other seafood where we know that it's sort of 50-50 sort of um, from aquaculture and fisheries. So from a production point of view, uh, again, I draw a lot of inspiration from our neighbours. So Indonesia is the single, the, what's going to be actually soon the single largest country for seaweed production, overtaking uh, China that's been uh, the, sort of in the lead for the last 50 odd years. So the mass production of seaweed in Indonesia is um, is very uh, small uh, farmer livelihood um, based. So basically these are, in places like Nusa Lombongan, so that's just the, the small island to the east of Bali. Um, you may have actually seen it. Um, unfortunately, this, this site now has been uh, removed because of tourism, but there we go. Maybe COVID, it'll switch back to seaweed farming again, rather than six star resorts that adjacent. So what I'm looking at here, and I'm putting the cursor over, is an individual seaweed farmer plot. And all these boats are actually seaweed farmers, and they all have their, their plots of seaweed um, that are out there on the shallow reef flat. Uh, underneath, this is what it looks like. There's lots and lots of ropes around about a, a foot apart, where, again, every uh, you know, 20 to 30 centimetres is a small uh, rope where the seaweed is broken off. A piece around 50 to 100 grams is reattached uh, and then grows for up to over a kilo in about two months and then that whole line is taken back and harvested. Um, people are then pulling up their seaweed. It's actually a red seaweed but it looks green in this case because red seaweeds can be any colour under the sun because they've got so many diverse pigments. So that seaweed is taken up um, and then basically dried um, and then sent off for processing. So it's a real commodity and that's where a lot of carrageenan is happening from. The reason why I sort of want to talk about this is that the scale of operations is, is huge and there's uh, more than 200,000 uh, seaweed farmers or basically farming families uh, in Indonesia that are involved in it. So a really big uh, industry and they're starting to grow much more. But of course what that means is that when you look off the coast in a number of places, all you see is seaweed farms. So can you imagine something like this off the Sunshine Coast? A whole lot of ropes and lines and plastic bottles and stakes? Of course not, but it's the, the type of scale that you need to be at to be able to service a real commodity industry. We've got other um, places and countries that we can look to. Uh, Korea is a good example where they've got a pretty good combination of, uh, of large scale intensive aquaculture of seaweed. So this is probably more amenable to some of the, the styles that we're used to in Australia. Um, but we still need to come up with our own way of doing things. And so if we look now to southeast Queensland, how could we start to have a contribution here to a new seaweed industry in Australia around the production of asparagopsis? And it's, um, it's got to come from a couple of different angles. Um, the, the band that we're at from a latitude point of view is that we're not too hot and we're not too cold. It's almost like the Goldilocks sort of side of things where we can have year round production of, uh, of seaweed either on land or in sea. So these are angles that we're, we're looking at. Um, for how to actually go about it, but we're right back at first principles. So for now, going out, collecting uh, the asparagopsis. Uh, this is the one of the team members, Valentin. He's uh, been collecting just here off uh, Moffat Beach, which uh, is all of the rocky headlands around from uh, Moffat and Dickey Beach all the way around to, to Kings Beach, a uh, real haven for asparagopsis, as are a lot of the um, offshore uh, reefs as well. So we can collect enough to be able to do some trials around the chemistry and the drying, and then also on the growing side of things. Um, underneath the, the water, here's what it looks like. One of the honours team uh, members, Maddie, here is, is uh, basically just doing a, a survey because we're still interested in um, how much seaweed. So uh, Shane mentioned at the beginning sort of the reef check um, um, mandate for understanding uh, changes in, in diversity and abundance of different uh, organisms off the coast and that's something that we're quite keen to, to do is to understand how it ebbs and flows with different times of the year. The reality is that it's all year round which is pretty impressive because that's not the case up in uh, North Queensland in Townsville where we only used to see it for a few months of the year because it got too hot. So here's a, a sort of image of the, of the seaweed there at the end. Um, mostly when it's new growth it's all pink 
and then over time it does get a little bit uh, foul and bleached as well. So again, aquaculture is the type of thing where you can get a really clear uh, quality control of that too. But the next step for us is really about production and trying to be able to control and manipulate the life cycle. So taking seaweeds back to our facility that we have at Bravi Island Research Centre and trying to grow up the seaweed in intensive um, tanks to be able to look to service and larger scale trials in the short term of um, the seaweed. So this is a pretty high quality um, video, so bear with me, hopefully it'll, it'll play a little bit. So this is uh, the facility team members, myself, I'm the only one without a hat, it's very poor sun management there on my behalf. Uh, so we've got a whole array of a thousand litre tanks here. What you can see is there's a central standpipe that actually is screened so that the seaweeds don't move down. Uh, there's a lot of aeration in all the different tanks. So from small scale ones, so buckets that are heavily shaded where we're identifying new species or new strains, taking them all the way through thousand litre tanks to two and a half thousand litre tanks where there's a central airline and it's basically tumbling the seaweed around. So with seaweed production in tanks and why they can produce so much is that compared to offshore, if you're attached to a line, there's no control. But when you actually take the seaweed from a rock platform and put it into a tank, it doesn't actually need to be attached. and It can tumble around and grow to very high density. So we can produce a lot on land. But the end game is really to start to look at how to be, we start to do it off the coast. So when I look off our entire southeast Queensland coastline, there's certainly a lot of places that seem like they would be good for farming, but a whole lot of social and economic and other considerations and environmental considerations come into place. So what we're really looking to do is to go back to that concept of integrated aquaculture, where in places like on even some areas of Morton Island, where there's oyster farming, uh, leases down the, the southern tip of Morton Island, I said, can we actually look to integrate with them? And that's um, a whole way of uh, producing aquaculture in a place that's already got aquaculture infrastructure, people are used to having oyster farms, they're used to seeing the baskets, can we adapt? the seaweed culture to an existing aquaculture facility rather than trying to start from scratch and having to jump through all of those hoops. So oyster farmers are growing the Sydney rock oyster that are at the top of the range of uh, Sydney rock oysters in um, Australia. So there's a lot of pressure on them from an environmental point of view as the temperatures rise. Um, there's disease issues, having a separate seaweed, um, basically a product stream diversifying when they're out on the lease all the time, moving the baskets around is particularly attractive. So this is one of the big things that we're doing. And then if you start to look at the really big scale, what would it mean? How could we have a real impact? So a lot of the aquaculture industry in Queensland, especially uh, south of the Great Barrier Reef, where there will never be any aquaculture in the, in the ocean, um, there is aquaculture adjacent to the uh, reef in terms of on the, the land, of course, uh, corn farms, but there won't be anything in the sea. We have um, the state government that has designated particular lease areas, so reasonable size, and there's a 15,000 hectare combined lease, and there's about 100 different leases, up around Harvey Bay in, in different places. So, of course, not near whale areas and uh, not near uh, communities. And that's no feed aquaculture. So you can't put a fish farm there, but you can put things like seaweed. You can put things like oysters. Uh, um, you can uh, do coral uh, propagation if you wanted to, or sea cucumbers, anything that is no feed. So if we're looking at how do we start to service this big picture, there's 27 million head of cattle in Australia. 90% of them are just walking around North Queensland and uh, Northern Territory and WA, and they're going to be very difficult to get that seaweed to. But we've got 2.6 million a head of cow in uh, both in feedlots. So that's dairy uh, is around about. 1.6 um, 1. million head of uh, dairy and then 1 million head of beef. And we know that they need about 25 grams of dried seaweed. So that's about a handful uh, per day to have a pretty significant reduction in, in methane. So when you do those calculations and work out based on our known uh, production rates that you could do in the sea, uh, we could do about 10% of that Australian um, feedlot herd in, uh, in around about 1,200 hectares. So that's 10% you know, um, of the zoned area for what is already zoned for aquaculture in Harvey Bay.
but why not 100? Why not 12,000 hectares? Well, there's a whole lot of, again, social, economic reasons that we have to work through for that. So it's best to sort of start to scale up and for everyone to get comfortable. But then these are regional areas. There are jobs uh, that people need to have. There's agriculture uh, in terms of, uh, we've got uh, Bundaberg there, but of course Rockhampton and Beef uh, further up the coast. So it's a, quite a good um, place to be doing it. And the world is actually looking uh, to us still uh, to see if we can uh, commercialise and get this technology out. So the final slide or two uh, is really just to put it all in perspective. So at the moment we've got climate change and protein production and when you look at how um, what the, the carbon footprint is on the greenhouse gas emissions per 100 grams of protein, beef, lamb, beef in terms of the dairy side of things, cheese, milk, these are all ruminants, other than prawns, ironically, which is because there's such an energy intensive uh, thing to do to uh, use prawn production. But all of these are ruminants and all of these are relying on um, people trying to come up with new ways of dealing with it. We're already seeing though, uh, some farms are starting to be carbon neutral just through land management processes. So I'm gonna start posing the question, so either do we not eat meat or maybe do we even start to get towards carbon negative with a combination of really good land management, the right macro feeds, so general feeds, as well as the seaweed, it could actually be a point where feed farm farmers are actually carbon negative for their beef production, which would certainly be something that would be very marketable in the marketplace. So just to summarize, so we've got this incredible market opportunity for the red seaweed. There's so much science to be done, but the reality is we've got this ability to reduce methane um, and that gives a whole lot of um, farmers, agriculture, who don't necessarily want to do this, of course, because it might actually be a cost for them, um, freedom to operate in this sort of greenhouse gas regulated environment. We've got the productivity benefits. So uh, one of the questions was how much does it cost? You have to look at both the positive and the negative. So the fact that the animals grow faster, less time on the land, less feed input, means that that is actually factoring in, which is great. And then last but not least, because we're starting to work on this, we're actually peeling back new areas of discovery and finding new things where there's livestock uh, in terms of cows, but also in terms of all other um, food production, so animals, fish and the like, and looking at the immune system boosts and the ability to actually reduce mortality with disease. So once you start to work on this type of area, there's all these other um, potential opportunities start to cascade, which has been such an exciting thing to be a part of uh, with the team here at USC, really taking it and looking at it um, in a much broader way with uh, our expertise that we have here on the Sunshine Coast. So that's it really from me. It could be an environmentally friendly Australian made food all because of seaweed. So that'd be great. So thanks for listening. And I'll, I'll try and go back to some of those questions now. Thanks, Nick. That was excellent. That was so interesting. Um, you said it was too good to be true. And then you talked about scaling it commercially and it sounds like it is pretty doable. So it sounds really good. Um, so yeah, I, I got kicked off a couple of times. My Wi-Fi went down, so I don't have the list of questions, but if you wanted to go back and, um, have a look at the questions we missed and address them, would that be okay? Oh, I will. Pretty Thank good. You. Thanks everyone. All right. So Susie Chapman. Hello, Susie. Could ask me a question uh, back in the day when we're on the same site. So we've got, if it's farmed in polluted waters, is there significant uptake of the uh, pollutants? So this is that funny thing that it seems like a conundrum, but it's not really, is that uh, a lot of our pollution uh, is is nitrogen and phosphorus off the coast. Uh, and there are heavy metals uh, and the like, of course, but for the most part, it's pretty good. And the, the seaweeds don't take up a lot of those heavy metals anyway, because they they don't um, they basically don't want to be um, killing themselves. So the reality is that the real pollutants of nitrogen and phosphorus are two things that we want to extract from the coast because we're putting too much in from uh, human in development and, and also from agriculture. So uh, the whole idea of being able to have a, an industry that's an extractive industry as well to take out to try and switch the balance back a bit um, is, is certainly something that we want to be looking into. Uh, I feel like I need to go back to the top just in case I know that I, I was skipping over some 
some questions. Would it be expensive to the farmers? That was from Sammy and that was it's straight up it's the most important thing, right? Because uh, the farmers go, well, that's all good and well, but how much do I have to pay um, for it to be environmentally friendly? And so the, the nice thing and really what I was hoping to elaborate on is the, the two different books that my uh, Don Retriever visiting you coming in. Yes, thank you. There you go. <laughs> She's uh, just uh, hearing me talk for an hour. Um, so basically they're um, to the point where if we can make it so attractive that they have to be using the seaweed because they're getting productivity gains. That's really the, the key for that, which is great. Um, Brendan asked about water temperature affecting growth and um, the what happened uh, certainly off, off the coast here is that the, uh, the warmer times of the year, they do sort of peak around January and February and, and do drop off a little bit but there's always different strains that are out there. So what we're starting to uh, really look into now from a research point of view is, uh, is to actually understand how the, we can have different strains. Um, so it's not as though there's just one population of asparagopsis on our rock platforms. They're certainly reproducing at different times of the year. And what we've seen in places like the Mediterranean is that there's actually different genotypes growing at different times of the year. So we've got a lot of diversity that we can start to pick up, which is, um, which is great. Uh, Tasmania, people are talking about water temperature again with Tasmania um, and the kelp forests. And so as uh, Jody mentioned just before we came, went live tonight is that it really is, and, and I think Terry said before, it is a bit of a pest uh, in terms of it's really abundant uh, off the coast here. And um, I, I know that we're, so normally we're at the bottom of the natural range of Asparagopsis taxiformis, which is the warm water one, um, and it hadn't been identified in northern New South Wales. That's going to be changing pretty soon. Uh, so it's definitely getting to the point there that it's um, uh, sort of changing in terms of the, the diversity. It's not going to be negatively, negatively affected like the kelp though um, in Tasmania where they've had summertime essentially increases of four degrees which is just above um, the natural tolerable range of the, the kelp. Sorry, scrolling through. Thanks. Thanks for saying thanks everybody. Uh, the best way to stay updated. Uh, so we've got a, a USC seaweed research group now and uh, our wonderful marketing and external engagement team are right at this moment putting together a whole um, package for us that will have a much greater web presence um, sometime in the next couple of months. So we'll be on all different socials then as well. So uh, I'll, I'll be sure to flick it to Reef Check as well along the way. Uh, Pablo, what did you say? Quantify the results reducing the CO2. Is there any way to measure? Um, how much less CO2? Yes, so the, the original studies were done, as I mentioned, in a closed vial, basically in vitro. So taking some of the rumen room fluid from the cattle and putting it into jars and then adding in the seaweed. The, all the second series of studies have actually been with live animals. So adding in the seaweed and, and measuring the amount of methane and other gas that's coming out. So there's two different ways that they do that in Australia. Um, the trials at CSRO were doing with basically um, coercing the, the animals into a, a chamber where they would actually then um, measure the amount of gas that they're making. In um, University of California, Davis in California, with their trials, they've actually got a, essentially a uh, methane breathalyzer where they've got a little cue to walk up and eat some of the, the, the diet. At the same time there, they're breathing constantly because you know, they're not sort of belching in that large, sort of loud sort of way. They're just sort of constantly um, belching uh, over time. So it's just like uh, when you're um, blowing into a breathalyzer. So. So Terry was asking about the purifying the uh, waste from prawn farming. Uh, could this be combined? Absolutely. Um, so there are more costs for land-based production. Um, so in the, in the short term, uh, I think that it will be uh, quite costly to do, but you get much more control. So what's probably going to happen is that there'll be a combination of both land-based and sea-based. Sea-based might be a little bit less... Um, 
sort of lower value or sort of lower quality in the sense of the quality control and land base might be a higher sort of uh, quality and so what we can do though with the land is really start to select for seaweeds that have the highest level of that bromoform so again it's going back to classic um, chemical ecology and science looking for trade-offs between growth and the amount of compounds that you're producing which obviously is searching for the holy grail there where we're producing the most amount of seaweed with the least amount of um, sort of inputs so uh, has anyone done spatial prioritization of where to scale up? No, not, not in a formal, uh, formal way, um, but we're certainly looking at um, the, the social benefits. I you know, mentioned that a couple of times. It's so important that the community is engaged and, and willing to be a part of it. And so that's why these things just have to take time. We're not being cavalier and jumping straight in and saying, yep, we're going to farm uh, 15,000 hectares off, off the coast. It's going to have to be something that builds up to that. Um, and then the people in Japan, uh, someone mentioned, is there a good organization or institute that are working on this research in Japan? Uh, absolutely. So as of uh, two months ago, ago uh, USC now has a collaboration with the Australian Research Council Discovery Project, which is one of our sort of most prestigious research uh, funding agencies. We just started a project with the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So Okinawa is a subtropical island uh, south of Japan. It's sort of almost the same uh, latitude as where we are here on the Sunshine Coast and, and Harvey Bay. So we're working with them on the molecular side to understand the genome of the seaweed so that we can really try and fast track. I sort of compare it to, we've had hundreds of years of agriculture culture where all of our crops are now being selected we want to jam those hundreds of years into about 10 years of production for the seaweed and we don't need the great thing is we don't need to do anything GMO there's so much natural diversity out there that we can tap into in the in the short term thanks Michelle I'm happy to uh, yeah, connect with you by email as well about other things um, uh, in, in regards to sort of different um, farm management. There's lots of people that are interested, but I'd certainly also divert your uh, um, inquiry to the Future Feed company because they're uh, looking at now um, taking it to basically to, to market and getting a whole list of partners together that can work um, on this project because it's not just, can't be just one group that is doing it. It's too important and it's too big. <laughs> So from Jara, have any farms started feeding their cattle seaweed regularly or is it too early? It is too early and it's just the supply side of things. Um, so while we're talking about this one, let's call it magic seaweed. So the Japanese people are calling it magic seaweed because it is um, so special in that regards to the effect. But that first uh, slide that I showed you that had all the different panels of all the different seaweeds, um, just like that original anecdote that came from the farmers in Canada and also in places like Scotland and Ireland, um, is that all seaweeds are actually good. It's just that none reduce anywhere near as much of the asparagopsis, but if they're actually getting a little bit of seaweed feed and they're taking off for a small amount of methane and using some of the existing seaweed that's already been commercially produced, then that's probably a really good short-term um, goal as well. So. I think I've caught up with everyone's questions. Sounds it's great good. to see so many questions. No yeah, one's asked anything about, anything about vegans yet, so that's, that's always interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a good question. I did think of that halfway through the presentation, Nick. Um, that what was my question about veganism and vegetarianism. Does that, with the alternative meat um, craze that's going on now, will that significantly significantly change the scales and have you been approached by other meat companies and the meat industry to support this research yet? Yeah so the original research that uh, the funding that we got was through the peak body uh, meat and livestock Australia so that's the red meat um, research oh, okay. um, sort of group development corporation uh, so yeah they're, they're of course interested in that but it's you know it's constantly I mean we all know um, that meat in terms of meat production is having a big impact on, on, um, on greenhouse gas emissions and that's one of the many reasons why people are choosing to eat less um, meat so at least uh, for you've got to remember that 
well, in Australia and other places, I guess that's very reasonable, but in, in other places around the, the world, uh, meat is still such an important part of protein for uh, nutrition. So at the very least, uh, it's going to be a long time before meat is, is totally phased out. So at least this gives us a chance to do something pretty well in the next couple of decades. So, Yeah, that sounds good. And it looks like Julia said, thank you so much, Nick. That's such a promising area of research. It's great to see so much positive feedback. That's almost a nice place to end it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, um, on behalf of everybody, Nick, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and I know it goes without saying that everyone was super engaged and you can tell by the questions, it was excellent. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you to all the participants for joining. Um, just a reminder, our next one will be the second Tuesday of May on the 12th. Um, so if you want to jump on and then also if you have questions, that you want to ask Nick, um, you can email us at seqevents at reefcheckaustralia.org and we'll forward them on to Nick and get Nick in touch. Um, otherwise, can they email you directly, Nick? Or Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I've just posted the email address for us on the chat. If you guys have any questions, if you have feedback on the quality of the call as well, this was our first Zoom, online Zoom uh, Coast to Coral talk. I got kicked off three times um, and it reloaded me back in, but it looked like everything went smooth from your end, Nick, hey? I think so from my end. It's always hard to know exactly. Yeah, because you're kind of talking to nobody and it's very silent. There's no response. You don't know if it's going through, but I think uh, from what I heard from Renee and other ambassadors, it, it went really well. So, um, and Julie just said it worked really well in Caloundra and thanks Pablo appreciate it guys um, wish we had pizza but this is a good step forward so again thanks Nick we really appreciate your time and um, we'll be sending you a nice little thank you package in the mail soon too kind thanks everybody good night <laughs> have a good night guys